Fannie Willis, accused of witness tampering and perjury. We've all suspected it, but we're hearing it from a defendant now. His name is Robert Cheeley, and this was a filing that he submitted via his attorney into the court right before Judge McAfee is apparently going to be issuing his ruling. So that is coming any day now, and we have replies, responses, filings coming in, because remember that we covered another filing from Fannie Willis, which was her supplemental brief after the hearing, and she said that the evidentiary standard is very high and the burden of proof is very high. And so now the defendants are responding. And in this one, we have some pretty serious allegations, of course. Not only was there a conflict, an appearance of a conflict and an actual conflict, but there's also tampering and perjury that was committed. New crimes in this courtroom. So Robert Cheeley, if you don't remember him, he is an attorney in Georgia. He appeared on behalf of the Trump campaign and on behalf of the efforts, let's say, to have an investigation, a thorough investigation brought in 2020 after we saw what happened in Georgia. And we covered that here on this channel. We were here wrapping up the 2020 election coverage also wow good night everybody congratulations well done and we turn out the next morning we see that in fulton county there was a water main break huh at the stadium weird even the news anchors were like a water main break really okay i guess i'll report it <laughs> and then we wake up the next morning and whoop, boop, 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 boop. you know donald trump is now leapfrogged by joe biden give me a break all right so this guy was doing his due diligence investigating of course fanny has charged him and everybody with made-up crimes and so now he is responding to this saying, hey, Fanny, not only was there a conflict, this entire indictment was born out of a corrupt appointment of your lover, first of all, but now you committed new crimes and you should be investigated for those. Here is the filing. In Fulton County, Big Fanny Willis, as the prosecutor, gets hit with a response by Robert David Sheely, an attorney in Georgia. He says he's responding to Fanny's post-hearing supplemental brief, and we've got a nice one. It's filed in Fulton County. It's a 20 pager. Let's see what's inside. He tells us, all right, guess what? We're here. Robert David Cheely files his response to Fanny's post hearing supplemental brief. So we were at the evidentiary hearing. We had Adam Abate read us his PowerPoint slides like that. Have, 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 next slide. It was ridiculous. And then they said, well, we have a bunch of other things we want to say because that was so terrible. Our you know eyeballs were falling out of our heads. So they submitted a supplemental brief. We read through the full thing here. And essentially, quick recap, but Fanny said that there needs to be an actual conflict of interest and that actual conflict of interest has to be essentially be pecuniary, you know, meaning it relates to money, and it has to essentially be in the outcome of the case, like only in the conviction. She's like, wow, all those requirements, like we have to hit all those boxes in order to disqualify you? Obviously, that's ridiculous. You know, it's like the highest standards. You can only disqualify us if she had an affair with Nathan Wade on Mars. Yeah, the planet. Well, no, that didn't happen. Well, that's what the case law says. Okay, Adam, sit down. So, you know, it's like a nonstop thing with him. Then in order, it, once those are the defined elements, the next question is, what is the burden of proof? It, is it clear and convincing evidence? Is it preponderance of the evidence? Is it beyond a reasonable doubt, the highest standard? Where is it? So now they're responding to those arguments. So here they tell us, they hit Fanny with a dictionary. Okay, they pull it off, off they're Webster's. You know, it's not Webster's, it's Black's Law Dictionary, which is about just as big. And they say, here you go, Fanny. Here's a dictionary for you, read this. They say Black's Law Dictionary, and that's the name of it, you know, just to be ultra clear on that. It's called Black's Law Dictionary. Black's Law Dictionary helpfully defines a conflict of interest as a real or seeming incompatibility between one's private interests. And this doesn't mean genitals. I know we're talking about Fanny, but you know, there's a lot of double meanings here. Or, and one's public or fiduciary duties. Okay, so let's try this again. Black's Law Dictionary says, it is a conflict of interest, a real or seeming incompatibility between one's private interests and one's public or fiduciary duties. All right, got that. Black's Law Dictionary, okay, from 2019. And it's not a racist dictionary, okay? It's not. It's the name of the book. This is in law libraries all over the place. It's not racist or cultural appropriation, okay? It's not. It's not. They say the Fulton County DA has improperly financially benefited, Fanny, improperly financially benefited from the contracts, from the investigation, and the prosecution of this case that the DA awarded to her romantic lover, Nathan Wade, under the cover of night, which we saw. The cell phone records prove that, baby. He got the phone call. He hops in there. There's a Fanny call. He's racing down there to Robin Yurdy's condo on the phone the whole time, pinging off the cell towers. He shows up there. He definitely doesn't lay his head down to rest, not for a minute, because they must be in the kitchen or whatever on the couch, but he never stayed the night over there. Then he leaves four in the morning, goes back home, sends the 
I love you, baby. I'm home safe. Hope you have, you know, a good day today. Text. We know. Under the cover of night. Yeah. Robin Yurdy testified that DA and Wade, they began a romantic relationship in 2019. This is confirmed by the many text messages that we also saw from Terrence Bradley, that guy who lied on the stand multiple times. The incontrovertible cellular telephone records that we saw, as well as the proffered testimony of Cobb ADA Cindy Yeager. Okay, a lot of names there, but we remember Terrence Bradley. Remember, he was the one who was trying to draw a very fine line between bro talk and pro talk. He said everything was pro talk. Judge said, no, it's not. Actually, that's a lot of bro talk there. So you got to talk about that. They brought him back out there. He basically doubled down on his, it was speculation. I don't recall. His text messages said the exact opposite, as we know. Cell phone records we talked about. Cobb was the newest DA who said that she also talked. Cindy Yeager was the Cobb County DA, a prosecutor, just like Fanny, who was in another county over, who said that Terrence Bradley showed up in her office and she heard a phone call from Fanny to Terrence that said, they're coming after us. You don't have to talk. Okay. Now, after all that happened, now two years later, in November 2021, the DA, Fanny, hired Wade. At no time then or since until forced by the current motions, shout out to Ashley Merchant, who blew the lid off this whole thing, did the DA or Wade disclose their relationship? No. Instead, they conducted themselves in secret as Wade lavished the Fanny with financial benefits derived from Fulton County and from Georgia taxpayers. Wade has since received hundreds of thousands of dollars from three different contracts with Fulton County that are directly related to this prosecution. Footnote one saying, and by the way, this amount does not reflect any income that Wade received from contracts held by his partners, which he admitted to benefiting from after also splitting the profits with them. We go back, they tell us. The DA Fanny also in turn has benefited to the tune of at least $17,000 in the form of vacations paid for by Wade, plus an unknown additional amount for numerous dinners and day trips. So it appears, says Chile's defense, that funds that came from Fulton County and from Georgia taxpayers were strangely found their way to various hotels and to airlines and to restaurants, all for Fanny's financial benefit. They say the technical term for that scenario is an actual conflict of interest, Fanny. Now compounding the conflict of interest, neither Fanny or Wade disclosed their relationship or the related financial benefits. In fact, they did everything possible to conceal those problematic details until Ashley Merchant and Mike Roman, until their disqualification motions forced them to respond. And even then, Fanny and Wade only cryptically acknowledged their quote, personal relationship. Yeah, as we know, meaning indicting each other, saying it began at an undefined point in 2022. Yeah, right. And boldly maintained that the DA received no funds or no personal financial gain from Wade. Even Stevens, I paid cash with everything, you know? And furthermore, the DA twice falsely certified that she had received no gift or benefits despite knowing full well that Wade was a literal prohibited person that she had in fact received gifts and benefits from. Lied about it on her public disclosure forms. Now doubling down on their deceptive filing and their false certifications it really is a double down. I mean, honestly, if they would have just come out and said, hey, at the very beginning, yes, look, we were both judges. We had our robes on. Our emotions got the better of us. We just got done watching Judge Judy and we were all fired up. Rah! So we were, you know, we couldn't keep our hands up. Okay, fine, whatever. It's like, all right. Now still corrupt, still a conflict, still a problem, still, you know, really, really unbecoming behavior of a DA and your special prosecutor and all that. But the lies on top of it and then the lies on top of the lies is like, we're like inception layers of lies now. It's like, oh my goodness, I can't keep track of it. There's a lot going on, but that is compounding this. And they just even brought Terrence Bradley out like a second time and he did it again. So the DA and Wade said they provided false testimony, okay, to this court to cover their tracks. They had a personal interest in the cover-up and they lied to do it. Let's go through it, they say. Starting with Wade, he maintained the veracity of prior sworn filings that conveyed he never entertained other partners beside his wife. Remember that Nathan Wade filled out the interrogatories with his wife. He was going through a divorce at the time. Well, he got the contract from Fannie on November 1st, filed for divorce November 2nd, the next day. Once he had his sugar mama lock him up, a $700,000 contract in Fulton County he says, so long, Joycelyn. Nice couple decades of being married to you. Thanks for helping raise the kids. I'm out of here. One day after the contract. Okay. Then while they're still married, he's an attorney so smart that he got the special counsel position. He gets asked specifically, are you married? Have you had interrelationships? Like big paragraph, not like, are you married? Like however you define it today. Are you married? Do you feel like you're married in your heart, Nathan? No, it's like a legal form. Are you, you know, you're married. Did you have any? 
inner indictments with this person. And he's like, no, I didn't. He knows what he was doing. He was lying. And then he maintained that lie in court, right? So he lied once and then lied again. Now, Wade has been legally married for decades and he admits to paying the DA to vacation with him on numerous instances, bringing his Fanny all over the place. And Wade also insisted that Fanny paid him back in cash or in kind to divide expenses, quote, roughly evenly. He then conveniently explained that he never deposited any of that cash so that no records could corroborate any reimbursement. And finally, Wade then again falsely testified to minimize the impact of their relationship on this case that he visited Fanny's condo no more than 10 times. But that's not true. Cell phone records reveal that he visited her dozens of times before that date in just the first 11 months of 2021 before they even say that there was a relationship. Remember, they said it started in 2022. Now, they say, take a look at the redacted records that we've already filed. Cell phone records that came in. Now, as for Fanny, writes the defense for Chile, she also maintained that her romantic relationship with Wade began in early 2022. Now, this is even though the aforementioned cell phone records reveal a scandal in the Fanny household. Numerous late night and early morning rendezvous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were rendezvousing between her and Wade. Fanny further claimed to have only, quote, repaid Wade in cash and that she had this cash stored in her home for years. Yeah, and they say, hey, by the way, you know, that's an interesting thing. They say some federal courts, just so you know, Fanny, like this case, U.S. government versus $37,000 in U.S. currency, Second Circuit case decided 1990. They say, note that in some federal courts, they suggest the possible existence of a rebuttable presumption that the possession of a large amount of cash is per se evidence of illegal activity. Hmm, wonder if Fanny, the so-called prosecutor, knows about that. You have a large amount of cash, you can rebut the presumption, right? The presumption is that it's illegal because why else would you have a huge chunk of cash? And she said, well, it's rebuttable. I have this because I'm saving for my husband a new car here, or I'm going on a cruise to Napa Valley with my illegally appointed lover. Well, that's why. Oh, okay. Well, that's not a crime. Maybe it is. So all of this continues with Chile's defense. They say, however, you know, Fanny though, she claimed at times she only had to, you know, about $500 to $1,000 in her cash stash, in her hoard. What'd you call me? Your cash hoard. Rah! Give me the documents. Far less than the few thousand that she claimed to have repaid Wade, and even farther less than half the more 17,000 that Wade contributed to her toward the clandestine relationship. Not even including the many, many dinners and day trips. We all know where they like to go. Moreover, Fanny failed to present any documentary evidence supporting these fantastical claims, and they are fantastical. $17,000. She reimbursed him from getting those, you know, would you like cash back with that? She's like, yeah, I got to pay my lover back. How much can I get? She's like, I don't know, $40 is our limit. She's like, well, that's a start. I'll take it. Thanks. Stuffs it somewhere. I don't know. So they say no evidence at all other than her own word to support these fantastical claims other than a receipt, a single receipt for a plane ticket. The only explanation that Fanny gave for the source of this cash was at times getting $50 cash back when making purchases at the grocery store. But then again, the DA provided zero credit card statements. So let us see all of those cash withdrawals. No debit card statements or any other documentary support for this specious claims. So they continue from the defense. They say dissatisfied with merely perjuring themselves. One crime isn't enough. They got to continue this whole charade, which we watched in real time. Fanny and Wade engaged in a coordinated campaign in addition to tamper with a witness. Whoo, yeah, they did. And to encourage the witness to present false testimony. That's Terrence Bradley. Now, specifically, Cindy Lee Yeager, who is a co-chief deputy DA for Cobb County, another prosecutor, right? So, I mean, this is how crazy this is. Another prosecutor in a, another county, separate and apart from Fannie, is the witness who's going to be the one behind this. Says, the office told counsel for Chile, that's the attorney writing this document, that Fannie called Terrence Bradley in September of 2023 and said, quote, they are coming after us. Fannie's on the phone. Hey, Terrence, they are coming after us. You don't don't need to talk to them about anything about us. They are coming after us. Now, Yeager, this prosecutor who's you know, sworn to be a prosecutor, uphold the law, pursue justice, all the stuff. She hears Terrence Bradley right up on the stand and she's like, whoa, man, that dude was saying a bunch of stuff that I know is not true because she had a meeting with him. So Yeager, the prosecutor, filed that affidavit and that came in from David Schaefer. Now, Mr. Bradley, Terrence, he also testified that another attorney called Gabe Banks, who we heard from at one of these
these early hearings. Gabe Banks, who is a friend and former Fulton County prosecutor who worked with Fannie Willis and whose wife, Gabe Banks' wife, currently works with Fannie. So Terrence Bradley gets a call from Gabe Banks and from Fannie herself, right? Fannie calls and then Fannie's employee's husband calls and there was another person who calls as well. So they're bringing this out now saying, look, called him in advance of his testimony. They're coming after us. Shut your mouth. And Mr. Bradley then took the stand. He's freaked out. Disclaimed any personal knowledge of the relationship between Fannie and Wade. Nope, no idea. Never heard about any of that. And it's all attorney-client privilege. Even though he had previously conveyed such knowledge to counsel for Roman, which is Ashley Merchant, texting her all day. Duh, 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 you know, all over the place logged. And now Cobb County. Another prosecutor, Miss Yeager. Two of them. Now we're in here explaining. They tell us, so, okay, you know, all right, Judge McAfee, listen. When faced with a mountain of evidence revealing obvious conflicts of interest and a receipt of improper benefits, Fannie and Wade, after we all knew it, they elected not to produce any meaningful evidence to the contrary. You know, they had all the records. They could have shown us. Yeah, it's 50-50. If Fannie kept the spreadsheet, it's all, you know, even Stevens. There are no bank statements indicating even a single cash deposit by Wade, not one, or a withdrawal by Fannie Willis, not one, even though each of them controls their own respective bank accounts. And in fact, we were here when they submitted Fannie's calendar events, and we made a mockery of those stupid calendar events because she showed up at 11.30, had lunch with her boyfriend at an anti-corruption meeting, got an award for some child victim thing, and then went to the 100-day celebration in the afternoon. That was her full day of work. What's going on over there? And the anti-corruption meeting was with her boyfriend, and she had other Zoom meetings that she just probably hopped on there with her camera off. You know, it's like, oh gosh, they're in big trouble. So even with all of that, nothing, right, was no evidence. They could have gotten some evidence if they could disprove this. But when, as here, when someone has evidence in their power and within their reach, this is the rules, that he or she can use to repel a claim or charge against them, but if they omit it, if they omit to produce it, or they produce evidence that's weaker or inferior, then a presumption arises that the charge or claim against that party is well-founded, right? If you can just disprove this with, you know, a simple photo or something, then that's easy, right? You just, hey, here's the claim, here's the photo. Clearly the photo shows that's not that. You don't have a photo. There's some interesting, you know, ways you can go with this. A lot of conversations about photos, you know, these days as well. So any presumption regarding reimbursement then must lie against Fannie and Wade. They said that they have cash deposits. They haven't shown us a single receipt, a single deposit slip. Do they not have access to their bank accounts? Weird. So if they can't even show you that, then you got to hold it against them. So that brings us, they say, to the state's post-hearing supplemental filing. And we read through this full briefing here. If you missed that and you want to see more of what was filed by Fannie, that of course is here on our channels. So that supplemental filing, it boldly proclaims that, Fannie argues, one, the defendants bear the burden of proving their claims. And remember we said up by a high standard of proof, which must be more than preponderance of the evidence. And that an actual conflict of interest must be shown to disqualify an elected Fannie. Now sandwiched between these two dubious propositions are bungled arguments attempting to analogize post-conviction review of disqualification rulings and distinguished citations that were cited by the defense. So they packed a lot in here. So they're going to go after now Fannie's original response. And we had previously talked about really the three standards of evidence that are most pertinent to our conversation here, which is preponderance of the evidence, which is, as we say in the law, like 51%. If it's more likely than not, cop says, hey, I think you're going 10 over. You think I, you say, I know I'm not. Judge says, well, it's uh, more likely that you were. He's certified. You're not. 51%. He gets the victory. You get the ticket. Okay. Preponderance of the evidence. Now, this is what Trump really wants. The next one would be, we call clear and convincing evidence, which is splitting of this and the highest one, which would be beyond a reasonable doubt, which is where you hear in the TV shows all the time, beyond a reasonable doubt. And so that's, think about like, you know, more 80 to 90%, I'd say, you know, even higher than that, but you'll hear a prosecutor say 80. So somewhere in between. Now, Trump's team wants to push this down as far as possible. They want to keep it near like 51%. Hey, look, it's a prosecutor, okay? They're supposed to be way above reproach. And if they're even close to this, it should be a low standard. It would just tripwire, tip it over. If it's more likely than not that Fannie was indicting Wade, well, got to go. Now the government's going to say it's much higher than that, right? It should be like 80 to 90%, like a criminal trial. They're not going to use that phrase because that's the highest, but they'll say higher than that. All right. So that's that. Now also an actual conflict and that the case law was bad. All right. So as explained further, they'll tell us the state exploits a single reference to one phrase. They want that higher standard of proof and it transmogrifies it into some high evidentiary bar. So they went through, they found some case law that says we have to have, if you're disqualifying prosecutors, a high standard of proof. Okay. What does that mean? But even if the state is correct, they say the movements, them, they have nonetheless proved an actual conflict by clear 
and convincing evidence, even though the actual burden is an appearance of impropriety by a preponderance of the evidence, right? So they're saying, look, Fannie is saying it should, you know, they didn't really tell us in their argument that they want clear and convincing evidence, but that's kind of the next logical step, right? They're not arguing for beyond a reasonable doubt. That's criminal code. That's a whole separate concept, right? It's a separate set of penalties. It's all in the burden of proof, you know, hierarchy. Then clear and convincing evidence. So they really want that. But Trump is saying, okay, look, first of all, that's not the standard. We agree that it's 51% preponderance of the evidence. But if it were clear and convincing, we would meet that standard easily because there is an actual conflict. So even if it was actual conflict plus clear and convincing, we still win. So they say, let's turn to the legal standard and get clarity on this because Fannie spent a lot of time on this. They say, first of all, Fannie and her insistence that only an actual conflict, you know, where it's actually a problem requires disqualification is an ineffective appeal to the lowest common denominator. Now that standard, the state thinks, provides just enough cover to skate past the disqualification here. If we use that standard, Fannie stays on the case. They say no, not quite though. No Georgia court has ever held that an actual conflict of interest is required for disqualification. Saying the state counters this, they say, well, you know, no court has ever expressly held that an appearance of a conflict or impropriety alone, absent an actual conflict, is enough to justify the disqualification. But many disqualification cases feature actual conflicts. But neither has any Georgia court held that an apparent conflict alone is not enough to warrant a disqualification. In fact, Georgia courts have acknowledged the very possibility. So a lot of words around what the court is saying about what does it take ultimately, right? What are the check boxes that they need to hit in order to disqualify? And this is how the law works. There's a lot of different courts kind of talking about it, but talking, you know, kind of aside each other and they're trying to smash it all into one. So they say, but this is what they want. They say, this is no surprise. They say it's old, well-established maxim of law that an appearance of evil is as much to be abhorred as the evil itself. 1977 case. To be sure about that principle, Judge McBurney also explained this. There was a prior order that disqualified Fannie. And in McBurney's order, disqualifying Fannie in another situation, he said a mere appearance of impropriety is generally not enough to support disqualification, except in the rarest of cases. Meaning he agrees. Yet this is one of those cases, is what he said. Now, but even if the court disagrees and elects to apply an actual conflict versus an appearance standard, so what are the rules? And then what are the standards? What's the burden of proof? What are the rules? What are the elements? And then how do you get there? This is also a case where the conflict is actual. It's not just an appearance, it's actual. And it's palpable. Ugh. It's not speculative and it's not remote. So either way, the defense have satisfied whatever legal standard the court applies. We don't care. They do, they want the lower standard because it's easier to disqualify her, but they'll meet the high standard too because this is one of the most egregious cases ever. Now, lastly, they say the state inaptly relies on post-conviction disqualification decisions. And we made a lot of criticisms about this when we were reading Fannie's response. They kept digging into post-conviction cases after the case was closed, right? After the case is over, they have a trial, somebody's convicted, they have sentencing, that person's gone. There's a whole series of cases and precedent called post-conviction relief. And there's different standards because, you know, this happens a lot, right? Everybody loses their trial. Then they say, oh, my lawyer was bad. They say, lastly, they use those and then they hypocritically attempt to distinguish dozens of other decisions that we cited. So they go get a bunch of garbage cases and they get rid of ours and shove theirs in. Now to start, they say appellate courts in Georgia reviewing disqualification rulings after a conviction necessarily did not apply the same standards as trial courts do in the first instance. Now the state says that any case involving conflicts that's attributable to private counsel did not apply to the disqualification of a constitutional officer, right? And Fannie's apparently one of those. Now yet the state itself cites numerous decision involving private counsel when it suits. So they're just picking and choosing cases. They also knock the applicability of this case and they re rely on this case, which are very similar. But also in that case, they failed to produce any evidence. And so we're just distinguishing cases and that can get tedious. Here's what the defense says. Administration of the law should be free from all temptation and suspicion so far as human agency is capable of accomplishing this object, 1852. Courts therefore have an independent interest in ensuring that criminal trials are conducted within the ethical standards of the profession and that legal proceedings appear fair to all who observe them. It's a very important part of our judicial system. In fact, arguably the strongest mechanism of our enforcement system, of the justice system, is its legitimacy. That's how it enforces anything. It's because people think it's legitimate. If every single person just didn't show up to court, that's kind of it. But we all do because we all think it's legitimate. Now, when assessing potential bias or conflict, our system of law has always endeavored to prevent, quote, even the probability 
of unfairness. Get rid of it. 1982 case. So with that in mind, the issue of attorney disqualification is a continuum. On one end, if we plotted this on a spectrum, disqualification is always justified and it's even mandated when, quote, the appearance of impropriety is coupled with a conflict of interest. Ooh, good case. Now, somewhere in the middle of the continuum, on the one hand, if you have an appearance of impropriety and an actual conflict, gotta go. In the middle, the appearance of impropriety is based on conduct on the part of the attorney generally has been found to be insufficient for disqualification of a private attorney in a civil context. Okay, so civil lawyer, not a criminal case. He did something bad, do you disqualify him? Maybe not automatically. So they say, thus it would be paradoxical if disqualification of Fanny, who is subject to the higher standard of public trust, right? So she is supposed to be even more beyond reproach, more trustworthy, more honorable, more integrity than anybody in the entire Fulton County. Public trust of a public prosecutor. It required a higher standard of proof than disqualification of a private attorney in a civil context. And finally, they're giving us some case law. For both prosecutors and for private counsel, the appearance of impropriety based not on conduct, but on status alone is also insufficient for disqualification. But in the present case, the defense most certainly is not seeking disqualification simply based on her status. So that case is not important. Rather, the disqualification motions target the improper conduct of the DA. So they're citing the status stuff. We're talking about her conduct. And they tell us, in sum, disqualification based on appearance alone, while it's rare and often insufficient in a civil context, it's still permissible when a prosecutor is involved, just on an appearance alone. That's because prosecutors are required to stand aside for the sake of public confidence in the probity of the administration of justice. And private lawyers are not. My right? public prosecutors, they're servants, they tell us. As such, when a prosecutor's participation could even, quote, cast doubt on the fairness of the trial, disqualification might be appropriate. Georgia case, 2021. No Georgia court has ever held that an actual conflict is necessary to disqualify a prosecutor, but that's what Adam Abate says. They continue, telling us that the state's opening gambit in their case is to insist that Trump and the defense and Chile and Mike Roman, that they bear the burden of proving their claims, but why they call is a high standard of proof, right? We don't know what it is exactly, which necessarily must be more than preponderance of the evidence, which is the lowest, and it must be higher than that. It makes this claim based on one sentence that they cobbled out of this case. The court said its role in addressing attorney misconduct and in holding those who allege such misconduct to a high standard of proof. So they capitalized on that line. That case cites another case, which just says that the standard to recover damages for defamation is clear and convincing showing of actual malice, which is a high standard of proof. So it's a defamation case. So then the state cites three other decisions that recognize the same thing. And then they proceed to invoke a host of unpublished 11th Circuit decisions for the unremarkable proposition that preponderance of the evidence is not a high standard of proof. Okay, it's great. It's all defamation cases. But McGlynn, however, is not the smoking gun that they think it is. McGlynn involved post-conviction review of a defendant's bid to get rid of the DA. So after this person was already convicted, then they said, well, now I should get rid of that person and do this whole thing over again. And it did not even implicate a conflict of interest at all. Rather, the defendant in that case that they're leaning on, it argued that a prosecutor's discussion with the witness before the trial ultimately resulted in the witness's decision on the advice of his own counsel to invoke the fifth. And that discussion, according to the defendant, violated his due process rights, which again, there's no conflict there, but there was no suggestion of any conflict of interest. Instead, the court held that the record did not establish any sanctionable conduct on the part of the ADA. ADAs talk to people all the time. Nothing in McGlynn sheds light on the present conflict-based disqualification. So this case is not pertinent. Thanks, Adam. Sit down. And random decisions invoking a generic phrase that they just pull out of their fanny, they say like a high standard of proof. And where did that come from? Outside of the disqualification context are irrelevant. They say here, we just went on our digital search engine called Westlaw and we typed in high standard of proof in quotes. And that brings up 14 Georgia decisions. Some of those involve defamation. That's why they got Terrell. And others pertain to proving intellectual disability in the criminal sentencing context. He asks a question. What do we make of this? Others involve municipal liability. Huh? So high standard of proof for what? Municipal liability. We've got defamation cases. Why is he bringing out all these cases? Like, why don't you go get like a divorce case? Uh -huh. Why do you go get a traffic ticket case? Go get one of those, right? In other words, it's not a standard in the law. They're just kind of making it up because they don't have a standard. They say, so what do we make of all this? Well, not much at all. Quote, high standard of proof is a common phrase employed in all manner of context to signify a wide variety of 
standards. Doesn't mean anything. Kind of means everything and nothing. So no Georgia court then has ever employed the phrase, quote, high standard of proof. Where did Adam get that from? Fanny tell him? Uh, just go tell him it's a high standard of proof. Like, Fanny, no, it's not real. Do it. Ah. And no Georgia court has ever employed the clear and convincing standard when assessing a conflict of interest. So their standard at the higher standard, or the one in the middle, is wrong. Now, indeed, no Georgia court has ever suggested that anything more than a preponderance of the evidence, the low standard is required for disqualification. If a court had said as much, if they had said that, then the state would surely bring that to our court's attention. But guess what? They haven't. Instead, Fannie and her office, they go and they cite a post-conviction review of an ersatz disqualification argument based on the alleged prosecutorial misconduct with a witness that resulted in a witness invoking the fifth. If that glaringly in opposite decision, in other words, this doesn't apply, if it is the state's best authority, then that is evidence enough that no Georgia court has ever disclaimed a preponderance of the evidence standard when assessing a conflict of interest. So they say it's never been a preponderance of the evidence standard, blah, blah, blah. And they say no. No court has ever disclaimed that, right, saying you can't use that standard, which means if no court has said that you can't use it, then you can use it. They continue telling us that aside from advancing an inflated evidentiary standard into the disqualification analysis, Fanny, she seeks to smuggle in an, an exaggerated legal standard as well. Specifically, Fanny contends that multiple Georgia Supreme Court cases clearly establish that Georgia trial courts are not authorized to disqualify elected DAs, absent an actual conflict, saying an appearance is insufficient. And those cases include these. They all cited. They cited Lee versus State, Blumenfeld, Lyons, Lamb, Williams, 1988. None of these cases, though, they say. None of them hold what Fanny says they do. They give us a breakdown. They say this first one, Lee versus State, it involves post-conviction. Again, we're not in post-conviction world right now. We're in pre-conviction land. This is all in progress right now. It is a totally in opposite fact pattern. Doesn't have anything to do with this case. There, a defendant said that a prosecutor should have been disqualified because of previous representation. But the defendant identified no evidence on the record that the DA actually represented him in a prior case or had any knowledge. And so therefore, the court affirmed the denial of the disqualification because there was nothing done here. Now, nowhere in this opinion does the court hold that the burden was by clear and convincing evidence. Nowhere. By contrast, no movement in the present case before you, Judge McAfee, has been convicted. That case involved a convicted person. No one has been convicted here. Defendants have produced a mountain of evidence demonstrating a conflict, and no defendant bears the burden of proving error by the appellate record. To the extent the court mentioned the lack of an actual conflict in that case, that language must be understood in the post-conviction context, where the only thing alleged was an actual conflict due to prior representation. It does not mean that disqualification for an apparent conflict would have constituted an abuse of discretion. So that case is totally inapplicable. Another one of Adam's crap cases called Blumenfeld describes general disqualification standards, but is of exceedingly limited utility here. Because in that case, the focus was on the status of counsel, not on their conduct. That case was a probate action. Supreme Court said other things, but the state is subject to higher standards than private lawyers in a civil case. And no defendant is advocating a status-based disqualification. So again, it's not on point. It's of no use in the present case because it's distinguishable. Adam tried another one with Fanny. These cases are also useless here because they involve convicted defendants who also raise ineffective assistance of counsel claims, right? I lost my trial. My attorney was terrible. So we have now to, you know, reopen the case. In Lamb, I want a new trial. The defendant argued that his trial and his lawyers were ineffective because he says there were conflicts. What were the conflicts? The trial attorney and his associate both represented the defendant's brother as another co-defendant in another criminal case, totally unrelated. And the court said, well, there's no actual conflict here. Like, what's the conflict? But where did that actual conflict originate? And they took it out from the Sixth Amendment. But no defendant here has raised Sixth Amendment claims. So these decisions, again, are inapplicable. So what those cases were decided on don't apply here. And lastly, finally, they give us some examples where other disqualification was appropriate. They say in particular, in these other cases, the court said a conflict of interest has been held to rise where the prosecutor previously has represented the defendant with respect to the offense charge. Now, the state took this decision and construed these examples as being exhaustive. But of course, the court did not say that. And here in this case, the defendants contend that Fannie and Wade, they have a personal interest or stake. We do, in fact, contend they have a stake in this prosecution. Why? Because Fannie has improperly benefited personally from this. She has had a financial largesse. That's true. Bestowed on her by Wade. Now, the state quibbles that 
but an interest in this case is distinct from an interest in a conviction, right? So Adam came out and he said, no, 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 no. They're not interested in a prosecution financially, which is obviously ridiculous from day one, because if Wade didn't indict them, well, there'd be no contract. What would the contract be for? To investigate them and then dismiss it? Obviously, it was to indict them. And then the renewals of the contract were to continue with the prosecutions. So if Nathan would have told Fanny, sweetheart, I love you, but I can't do this. All right, this is crazy, Doc. All of it would have gone away and she wouldn't have had extra money from Wade to go on her cruises. So they say, obviously, this is splitting hairs. It's not about the conviction. While neither Fanny or Wade will receive a bonus for any convictions, Fanny has inarguably personally benefited financially from her secret romantic entanglement and the money she arranged to be paid to Wade. And they continue telling us that there is an actual conflict and that warrants disqualification saying the state itself previously has acknowledged in this very case, Fanny said this, that prosecutors are held to higher standards than their counterparts in private practice. In fact, on September 20th, 2023, Fanny's office filed this, a notice of potential conflicts of interest about some defense counsel. The notice submitted by Fanny in relevant part stated that a prosecutor has the responsibility of a minister of justice and not simply that of an advocate. Yeah, right. Minister of justice with your $700,000 to your lover? Give me a break. Now the notice then went on to boldly emphasize, this is Fanny writing, in light of the prosecutor's public responsibilities, broad authority and discretion, the prosecutor has a heightened duty of candor to the courts and in fulfilling other professional obligations. Big Fanny. Now giving these lofty principles, which are conspicuously absent from their recent briefing, Fanny professed concerns about the defendant's rights to due process and to a fundamentally fair trial if certain defense counsel were not disqualified given their prior representations. So in other words, Fanny submitted this and said, Your Honor, some of these lawyers know each other and this lawyer representing this guy knows this guy and there's a conflict here because he knows something about that co-defendant and now he's representing this co-defendant. This is what government does. They try to pit defendants against other defendants, right? So like if this lawyer is representing, you know, I'm representing person A, but I had represented person B before and they're co-defendants in this case, now they might say that I know something about defendant B that I might use to give an inappropriate advantage to defendant A, and so I should be conflicted off because it's even though it's unrelated, they try to make co-defendants work against each other. So that's why it's difficult to have one attorney with two co-defendants because inevitably they're going to pit them against each other, and then the attorney's going to have to get off the case because there'll be a conflict of interest. But point is, Fanny submitted that in. Like, nobody was complaining about conflicts, and she's like, uh-oh, 19 co-defendants. There's only so many defense attorneys in Georgia, so there's a lot of overlap there. You got to get disqualified. Go find new lawyers. So she was trying to disqualify, you know, good attorneys from the cases. So they say, okay, if she has such a heightened duty that she has to sua sponte on her own, just get out and call the court's attention to this stuff, maybe someone should have called attention to her indictments of her boyfriend. Now, defendants, all we want to do is hold the state to the standard that they touted only a few short months ago, right? That's their standard. Heightened duty of candor. I love this. So they're just saying, hey, Judge McAfee, they brought this up. They told you in September, right? See how fun this is? They told you in their own filing in September that a prosecutor has a heightened duty of candor to the courts and in fulfilling all of their other professional obligations. Huh, that comes from Fannie Land. Yeah, the notice went on to say all of that. Isn't that amazing? So Fannie will drag that out when it's useful to her and then when she actually needs to obligate herself to that standard, she falls far below it. So how can they tell the court that they have a heightened duty of candor and then lie to the court right to Judge McAfee's face? In addition to the bevy of citations from their prior briefing, the Georgia Supreme Court's decision in Newman illustrates that an actual conflict is not necessary for disqualification at all. The defendant in that case moved to disqualify the entire office of Fannie's for the Stone Mountain Judicial Circuit because some prosecutors had read his privileged communications with the attorney. Now, the trial court denied that motion and the Supreme Court in Georgia affirmed, but the court hastened to explain. They said the disqualification of the prosecutor's office might be appropriate where the privileged information disclosed to the prosecution was so voluminous that it would cast doubt on the fairness of the trial absent disqualification of the prosecuting attorneys who had reviewed the files. In other words, the standard for disqualification was whether the prosecutor's participation, uh-oh, could cast doubt on the fairness of the trial. And that is totally inconsistent with an actual conflict mandate, which doesn't appear anywhere in the court's decision. The doubt cast is consistent, however, with an appearance of impropriety. Now, the state also invokes a host of other bad cases. They say no discussion of actual conflict they keep referring to. No discussion of it 
Circuit appears in numerous decisions that they cited, previously cited by Chile and others. All these cases, boom, 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 all of them, not in there. So to avoid the obvious doctrinal barriers that are impeding the government's preferred standard, Fannie and her office, the state, they hypocritically maintain that the decisions above are just not applicable. They say, well, we found these cases judged. None of them talk about actual conflict at all. They say, well, those aren't applicable. Why, they ask? Well, the state says these decisions, quote, do not apply to the disqualification of a constitutional officer whose loyalty lies with seeking justice, not with any individual or private client. That's a bold proposition, they say, considering that the state itself cites three decisions involving private counsel. Derp. So it appears that decisions involving private counsel only become relevant when they benefit the state. And that, of course, obviously is nonsense, they say. So given the higher standard of public trust that a prosecutor is to be held, it stands to reason that if private attorneys are subject to disqualification, then prosecutors are as well. But that heightened standard to which prosecutors are held also mean that prosecutors may be disqualified even where private attorneys remain. They have more standards than even other attorneys. Now, Fannie and her office, they implore the court. They say, ignore this case. And they invoke another decision involving similar circumstances. In the Davenport case, they held the defendant was charged and denied a fundamentally fair trial where the DA previously represented the victim, which was the defendant's husband in a pending divorce case, and was cognizant of information that occurred. And the attorney sat at the counsel's table for the entirety of the trial. Now, according to the state, the facts and the legal principles in Davenport are far too remote to be applicable here. So once again, the state gets to invoke any decision that it helps them, and they distinguish away other decisions that go against them. But no, judge, you know better than that. And finally, they invoke this Georgia code, even though it too does not demonstrate that an actual conflict is required. It doesn't say that at all if you read it. And so apparently they are ignoring, they say, Fannie is just ignoring all of her obligations. First of all, Fannie is a public trustee under Georgia law. They say Fannie has forgotten that she, her office, and Wade are, quote, trustees and servants of the people and are at all times amenable to them. Georgia Constitution that they ripped into shreds. Indeed, as the Georgia Supreme Court has emphasized, a trustee is held to something stricter than the morals of the marketplace. Not honesty alone, but the punctilio of an honor the most sensitive is then the standard of behavior. As to this, there has been developed a tradition that it unbending and illiterate. Malcolm versus Webb, 1955. And the most basic rule is that, quote, no public agent or trustee shall have the opportunity to be led into temptation or to make a profit out of others entrusted to their care. Don't take advantage of people. Now, while that may be inconvenient for Fanny, she accepted office. It was not forced upon her. She cannot therefore complain of the disabilities which are incident to it. Can Fanny, her office, and the Wades as public trustees, can they prosecute this case, quote, disinterestedly? Possibly, they may. But the law regarding our fallen nature as all weak forbids that any temptation be laid in the path of anyone, however exalted their office or pure their character, telling us that they're hearkening back to standards articulated at the outset. Both unfairness and the appearance of unfairness should be avoided. So, Chile's team continues, wrapping up, telling us, so wherever there may be a reasonable suspicion of unfairness, it is best to disqualify. That is the answer here. And for the reasons above, along with those articulated in Chile's initial reply, this court should disqualify Fannie Willis, disqualify her entire office, get rid of Wade, and dismiss the entire indictment. Signed by Christopher S. Anilwich and Richard A. Rice Jr. in the house. Nice filing from our friends in Atlanta, Georgia. On behalf of Robert Cheely and the big Fannie Willis Rico indictment. And so, this is the response. We're waiting for Fannie Willis replies. We're also waiting for other responses from other co-defendants. And we are going to be here covering all of the filings in the Rico case, of course. We also have some reaction from Representative Senator Reverend Warnock, who is a senator in Georgia. And he got asked about this when he was making the rounds on the media circuits. Here is what the senator from Georgia had to say. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis could be thrown off of Donald Trump's 2020 election interference case in Georgia after admitting that she had that personal relationship with the lead prosecutor, though she argues there was no impropriety. Do you think that relationship undercuts the integrity of the case and should she step down? Listen, we are watching our judicial process play out. And I know that there are folks, unfortunately, in the state of Georgia, politicians who are trying to put 
put their hand on the scale. I'm not going to pile on. I'm not going to add to that. I will watch this process play out, and we will see where the chips fall. But at the end of the day, here's what yeah. Donald Trump deserves. He deserves to have a uh. fair trial before his jury of his peers, in this case as voters of Georgia, and we need to see that play out. And given that, do you think that the optics have become so complicated around this that Fonnie Willis should step down for the better good of the case that you Too just talked about? Too late for that. Should have done that a long what? time ago. Listen, I think this case is being played out before a judge, and that judge will have to make a decision not based on optics, but based on the law. And Our, that's the wonderful thing about America. We believe that no one is above the law, including Donald Trump. What about Fannie Willis and the illegal immigrants coming across the border? Well, a lot of people are above the law in this country. Just ask Primala Jayapal and Joaquin Castro. No one is illegal. No one. All right. Of course, a lot of people are above the law. Joe Biden was, apparently. All you got to be is an elderly old man who doesn't know anything about classified documents. You're good. So the point is, in Georgia, we are waiting patiently for Judge McAfee to issue his ruling. He said it was going to be coming on Friday, and we're going to be here waiting for it to drop, my friends. And so thank you for joining us as we continue to cover not only this Trump trial, but all the rest of them, including the civil matters, the Supreme Court journeys that we're on. We'd love to have you join us here on our channel. Thanks for subscribing wherever it is you're watching it. Thanks for checking out some of the links in the description below. We've got robertgovea.com where we have all of the PDFs uploaded. Our calendar is there. We have watchingthewatchers.locals.com, which is our members only community. We do streams in the morning and on Saturday. We'd love to have you join us there and come to our event, watcherlodge.com. We have an amazing event, all free, watcherlodge.com. Check the links out in the description. We'll see you back here on the next one. Oh,